Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, good morning, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Raul Morales Huberias, and uh, I wanted to introduce you to uh, my project, which is Interdisciplinary and Comparative Planetary Atmospheres Research, uh, which is what I plan to develop while I'm here in my Fulbright semester uh, in Chile. Um, before I get into the research, though, I wanted to give you a little bit of a personal background. Uh, so I'm originally from Spain, uh, from the Basque Country, which is the province that is highlighted there in red. And uh, more specifically, uh, I come from the town of Bilbao. Uh, this is an aerial view of uh, the city. And as I said this morning, we are staying in uh, Viña del Mar. And to some extent, since being there, it's actually been kind of nostalgic in a sense, because Viña del Mar and Bilbao are a lot of things. Both of them are sort of coastal towns, and uh, the urban life uh, sort of reminds me of being there. So it's kind of um, the landscape is also somewhat similar. Um, and I also wanted to uh, introduce you to my family, which accompanied me in this Chile adventure. Uh, so my wife, uh, Emily, is also an educator, and we are traveling with our two kids, uh, Rafael and Rodrigo. And we've already been here for two weeks, so mostly adjusted. The kids are very excited because they are starting a school finally next week. Um, they were getting to the point that they were bored about being here, which <laughs> I can understand because it's been kind of crazy, but um, anyhow. And so they couldn't come with me to Santiago because they are still uh, ultimating the details and getting ready for starting a school next week. But hopefully we'll all uh, be able to come here some other day to just tour around, I guess. Uh, we don't come from Spain, though, obviously. Uh, I've been uh, living and working in the United States for the last 20 years, and for 17 of those, uh, the last 17, uh, we've been based in New Mexico, which is the state that I highlighted uh, here in red, and yes, it's still part of the state. Um, uh, more specifically, we come from uh, a small town uh, in uh, Socorro County, which is called uh, Socorro, and it's about one hour uh, south of Albuquerque and about three hours uh, north of El Paso. Uh, I work there at a local university uh, called New Mexico Tech. Uh, this is an aerial view of our campus. Uh, I work in the physics department, which is this building in here. And uh, even though we are a small school with a student body of about 2,000 students, uh, we actually have uh, very strong research programs. And the physics department, in particular, has a very strong astronomy and atmospheric science program. Um, if you have heard of New Mexico before, by any chance, it may have been in association with a very large array which is one of the main uh, observatories that the National Radio Astronomy Observatory has, uh, together with ALMA, now in Chile. And uh, there are actually a lot of connection from people from Chile going there uh, to uh, work on the VLA. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of the main antennas, and this is my younger kid, and you can see some of the other antennas in the background. And the other reason why you may have heard of uh, New Mexico in connection to science is because uh, of its connection with the Trinity side, with now the Oppenheimer movie opening in theaters worldwide, probably all of you are familiar with, is where the first uh, nuclear device was exploded in July 16, 1945, which I didn't know, but uh, according to Antonio, 1945 is also when the Fulbright program started, right? 55 in Chile, and then 45 it was, it was taken to all oh, Okay, yeah, okay. So anyhow, that, I found that interesting. So now going back to my research, uh, my main uh, research interest is uh, comparative planetology. Uh, my background is in astrophysics, uh, and I focus on the study of uh, bodies orbiting uh, stars, also known as planets. Yeah, this is a picture of our own solar system, so here we have the eight uh, planets in our solar system, and you can see that these bodies are very diverse. Uh, so they are diverse in size, in rotation rates, in formation. Uh, in our own solar system, we have a dichotomy, uh, so we have to measure uh, different groups of planets, the terrestrial planets, which are the smaller bodies closer to the sun. And then we have the gas giants, which is the ones that I uh, focus mostly, most of my research. And now there's a new category uh, called dwarf planets, which includes bodies like Pluto and Ceres. Uh, just in case you are ever in New Mexico and are participating in a trivia game, if I were to ask you here how many planets are there in the solar system, the answer will be? Uh, eight. eight, right? Yeah. If you happen to be in New Mexico, be aware that uh, for different historical reasons that I'm not going to read, in New Mexico, planet is still considered a planet just by legislature. So, <laughs> so be aware of that um, factoid. Anyhow, uh, going into the details, uh, within comparative planetology, I like to do uh, comparative atmospheric dynamics. And this is a very interdisciplinary um, sort of discipline. Uh, we use tools from um, different um, disciplines. We use tools from astrophysics, 
so we use observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope or the Very Large, large Telescope here in Chile to observe these planets. Uh, we also use tools from uh, atmospheric and ocean dynamics. So once we observe features in the atmospheres of these uh, bodies, we like to compare to things that we know. And so for example, here you have a picture of a vortex uh, and some turbulence in the Earth oceans. And this is a picture taken with the Juno spacecraft of uh, a vortex and turbulence in Jupiter. So as you can see, there are uh, striking similarities. And so we like to compare uh, what we uh, know from Earth and what we discover in other planets. And uh, we also use tools of computational physics. So as I said, this is an interdisciplinary area of research and we move kind of in that space in there because we build computer models to help us understand the origin and evolution of all these features that we observe in other planets. And this is the cluster that I have in the uh, physics building, uh, but I also use other clusters in different institutions. Okay, um, part of me coming here to Chile was also to uh, help establish inter, uh, institutional relationships. So I have to thank my university, New Mexico Tech, for giving me the opportunity and the time uh, to be able to participate in this experience. But I also wanted to take some time to thank the University of Valparaíso in Chile and specifically the Centro Interdisciplinario de Estudios Atmosféricos y Astrostatística. Um, and uh, here's a picture of my host in the University of uh, Valparaíso, Dr. Julio Marín. Uh, I met him when he visited uh, the U.S. for a short time and his family and my family kind of uh, got to know each other and we maintain contact uh, over time and we always talk about the possibility of me coming here and he going there for longer stays and so this was a good opportunity. Uh, he has been helping me and my family settle uh, in Viña del Mar and uh, giving us good feedback and as you can see here in their uh, website uh, the center also has a different interdisciplinary approach. Uh, so they do uh, mostly dynamics and physics of the atmosphere here on Earth. Uh, they focus on instrumentation, but they're also working with astronomers. And uh, I like this because, as I said, my background is in astrophysics, but then I sort of degenerated into atmospheric science studies, so I'm sort of kind of in between worlds. Uh, but I think actually that's good because oftentimes what is a problem for some people, other people have solutions, and I believe that working together is actually where more innovation can come from. Um, so my main goal uh, while being here in Chile will be to enhance the New Mexico-Chile connection. Uh, I would like to see more people traveling this line between the two different institutions, uh, both faculty and students. And in order to try to engage the students this semester while I'm here, I would like to work or continue work in three projects that I've been maintaining over the last several years. And uh, I would also like to participate in uh, outreach efforts, both in schools, uh, talking to students and teachers, and uh, also by engaging in public talks, maybe in the American spaces. Uh, now getting to a little bit of the nitty-gritty details of the research. Uh, one of the projects I've been working on for the several years is uh, tracking winds on the atmosphere of Jupiter. So the way that we do this is uh, we can take a series of images over time of the planet and we can actually see how the clouds move. This is a map of Jupiter uh, in longitude and latitude. And so what you are seeing in here is just clouds moving over time. So if we want to see how fast those clouds are moving, we can measure how long it takes to go from one place to the other. You have a distance, you divide it by the time, and you get a velocity, it's pretty straightforward. And um, by doing that, uh, we can get what we refer to as the latitudinal uh, profile of the winds on this planet. So that is how the latitude changes, as, uh, how the wind changes as a function of latitude in the planet. And as you can see, uh, mostly in the gas giants, uh, the pattern that we have is a series of alternating jets that go east and west and embedded between those jets, we find the uh, huge storms like the rare red spot that are kind of like big anticyclones. Um, we're interested in uh, understanding more how this uh, wind weather pattern changes as a function of time. So we've been tracking uh, this uh, wind pattern for over several years. And we are also interested in, in knowing how it changes uh, in longitude. And so you can actually do that with correlations, which is a uh, uh, the method that I described before of tracking how far things move over time. But we have also been interested in doing it uh, with a different method, which is Doppler velocimetry. Uh, the Doppler effect, I'm sure that you all are familiar with, is what we experience when we hear a siren of a vehicle, like an ambulance or a police car coming down the road. We all know that the frequency of the siren changes as, depending on the velocity of the vehicle, right? So we can actually exploit uh, that also to explore winds in other planets. Uh, we've built an instrument that uh, is capable of detecting the Doppler shift of light being reflected from the planet. And uh, so from that, we actually can estimate the uh, velocities. 
And here is some preliminary results showing the velocities that we get from the instrument. Uh, the idea is to deploy that instrument uh, in three different places in the world. Um, so far, we have been focusing on the, on the northern hemisphere because that's where we have most collaborators. But I don't know, maybe some, if I find somebody that's interested in hosting this here in Chile, that could be an option. And the idea is to have continuous coverage observation of the planet and reduce the signal to noise ratio and get better results. The main advantage of this method over the previous one is that the previous one, we can get information about the winds in one, two dimensions. With this method, we can actually get a three-dimensional picture of the planet. It's complicated, but I'm just going to leave it at that. Um, another project that I would like to engage the students with is uh, the study of the dynamics uh, of spots. And uh, there are spots in many of, the, of this atmosphere. For example, I mentioned before uh, Jupiter got a red spot. Uh, uh, for this particular uh, example, I have here a spot in the atmosphere of Neptune. So in 2018, uh, we discovered this uh, dark spot forming in the atmosphere of Neptune, and we follow his uh, lifetime cycle. Um, the spot uh, formed at a latitude of about 20 degrees and then started drifting towards the equator. At the same time as drifted towards the equator, it was getting smaller. Uh, we don't really understand much about the life cycles of these spots because there are not that many cases that have been observed. Um, so in this case, we actually use models, uh, which is kind of like the computer models that I was talking about at the beginning of the presentation to really understand the evolution of this spot as a function of time, right? So this is the same graph that I saw before about the vortex latitude as a function of time. We ran several models varying different things that I'm not going to get into the details of. Some models match the observations better than others. And with that, actually, ultimately, we also learn more about the latitudinal uh, wind profile in this case of Neptune. So this is similar to that figure that I saw at the beginning for Jupiter, where we have the latitude in the vertical axis and the winds in the uh, horizontal axis. And so different wind profiles, like the ones that are plotted in there, give different evolutions to the life cycle of the spot. And so uh, that's another project that I have uh, that I would like to engage students in. And finally, my last project, which is just kind of starting. We are working on a grant uh, to try to write this up and see if we can get funding to support students, will be to do uh, equatorial wave models uh, in this planet. All of these planets saw some sort of equatorial wave formation. Uh, this is an example of an equatorial wave on uh, Jupiter. You see all these alternating series of black and white regions as a signature of a wave feature. Uh, this is an example of an equatorial wave in uh, Uranus. Uh, and this is an example of an equatorial uh, wave in Neptune. So equatorial waves seem to be ubiquitous in these planets. And we would like to understand how they form and how they evolve. And so for that, we are going to be using the same models that uh, I was describing before to uh, study spots. And there are two main different ways that one can form these waves. One is by the uh, this, uh, the missile of spots as they migrate equatorward. And uh, another way is just by perturbations of the wind profiles. So in all these projects, ultimately, what we are interested in is in the three-dimensional structure of the atmosphere of these planets. And last but not least, as I said, I also want to engage in uh, outreach efforts while I'm in here. So I have experience doing outreach efforts uh, where we are in New Mexico. And these are different pictures of different events that we have had over the years in the schools. Uh, in this one, I think we were modeling craters with cakes. Uh, so we, were, we brought cakes to the schools, and the kids throw uh, marbles at them. And then we see how the shapes form and the splatter and all that stuff. Uh, in this other example, we are teaching the kids uh, about the different phases, uh, so how the face of a planet or the face of the moon changes as a function of the location of the observer and the sun. Um, something that I also personally like to do a lot is the solar system with fruits. Uh, the kids like a lot this, so I bring a bunch of fruits to school, I give them a little presentation about the solar system, and then uh, I tell them to tell me which fruit represents best each planet and why. And sometimes the students get really nerdy. Uh, for example, in this particular case, I talk to them about the uh, Saturn hexagon, and one of the kids got a Sharpie and drew a hexagon there in the top of that uh, campal of melon. So, and it's actually pretty accurate, as you can see. Um, <laughs> and then once I tell them about the sizes of the planets themselves, uh, if the school has a large enough uh, courtyard, I also like to take the students out and teach them not only about the relative sizes of the planets, but also about the size of the solar system itself. And they usually get amazed about how big uh, it really is. And so I would like to be engaged also in uh, outreach efforts while I'm uh, here. Uh, because I've discovered that it's a good uh, astronomy is actually a very easy field for getting people engaged because we have such amazing images from all the different missions and observatories around the world. 
And so finally, I would like to give thanks to all the organizations and institutions that have made uh, me be here possible. Obviously, I want to thank Fulbright Chile for uh, bringing me here, but I also want to uh, thank my institution for giving me the time, the University of Valparaiso, and in particular, the Centro Interdisciplinary of Studios Atmospherico y Astrostatistica. And I also have a list here of all my coworkers uh, that helped me with all this work uh, uh, over the years. And I think with that being said, I open this to questions that you may have about any of the projects or any of the things that I've been talking to you about.